Welcome, 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 everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Friday before the big weekend's games. No college football. Army Navy is going to kick on Saturday, and then it's all about the NFL. All the way up until bowl games start and the college football playoff begins. Started last night in Pittsburgh, where I got the opportunity to call this game with Ian Eagle. Um, going into it, there wasn't a lot of hope that there was going to be a lot of points scored in this game. First off, the total in this game was 30. We went with the under. Probably should have known that it was the most heavily bet under in, I think, the history, it seems like. Um, and uh, But every stat you looked at, if you, if you looked at the, uh, you know, the analytics of it all, you looked at the Patriots. Their defense had only been given up 8.6 yard or 8.6 points a game, where the offense, on the other hand, were only putting up 4.3 points a game over the last three games. So you didn't expect a lot. You had the backup quarterback and Mitchell Trubisky getting the start. A ton of injuries on the defensive side of the football for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I thought there was a real chance that the Steelers win this game 6-3. to three. I did not believe Mitchell Trubisky was a 6.5-point favorite in this game, so we went Patriots plus the points, and we got what we what we were looking for. You know, we got the uh, you know we got the, the Bailey Zappi that that we were promised. Uh, the guy showed up, and he did it with a, uh, an offense with really no skill position players. Devontae Parker was a last minute scratch, um, kind of a healthy scratch. What we thought turns out there was some injury issues that we didn't hear about necessarily. Talked to Bill O'Brien before the game. Uh, and he said it was an injury-based decision. Therefore, Juju Smith-Schuster was going to have to step up and have a big game. He did on the opening drive. Bailey Zappi was special in the first half. They went up and down the field. And he made maybe two of the best throws I've seen of a quarterback make this year to Hunter Henry uh, for touchdowns. One on the back of the end zone. He layered it right over the top of Minka Fitzpatrick. And then a little bit later, he beat uh, um, Casey, the safety, in a cover two look, who took maybe just a slightly – a bad angle, and literally there was a finger nail above it, and Henry makes a great catch. It was 21 to three, I think, or maybe 21 to 10 at halftime, uh, which hit the over for the game. 31 points scored in the uh, in the first half. Well, second half was much different. The Patriots got shut out. They didn't throw as much. They kind of went into protection mode, and the Steelers uh, clawed their way back in. They got a touchdown and a two-point conversion to cut it to 21 to 18. They also got a big interception, and maybe one of the biggest plays of the entire game was Zeke Elliott running down Michael Walker, who intercepted the pass, and tackling him before, his, uh, before he could take it for a pick six because the Steelers did not score a point then on that drive. They went for it on fourth down when kicking a field goal would have brought them within one possession. Instead, they go for it on fourth down and get stopped. Now, they get the ball back for, uh, pretty quickly on a, on a blocked punt, and that's where they get the touchdown and the two-point conversion. And then from that point on, nothing else happened. They punted it back and forth. Pittsburgh made some last-ditch efforts going forward on fourth and two and deciding to throw a, uh, you know, a, a, a bomb, essentially, to Deontay Johnson, where they hadn't done that all game long. They hadn't taken shots all game long. They brought the house, don't get me wrong, but they still had double coverage on it, and George Pickens was – uh, not happy about any of it. It wouldn't surprise me if we hear some stuff this week because the body language from him was poor. Steelers veterans, Minka Fitzpatrick in the locker room after the game, very upset with the way the guys are playing. Mike Tomlin talks about the standard. Is the standard? Well, the standard right now is you are the first team to lose to two two win teams this far into the season uh, at home over the last two weeks. Um they are defunct on offense. You know, the, the Matt Canada firing gave them a little excitement. And then you lose your quarterback. Mitchell Trubisky comes in. It wouldn't surprise me if Mason Rudolph is looked at here during the um, next coming weeks. And Trace McSorley even, who I saw throwing it around pregame. Bottom line, uh, Bill Belichick, who's coached, and I found this out last night, has coached 49 consecutive years in the NFL. I, it, he is... He has a longer coaching career in the NFL than I am old, okay? 49 years he's been doing it. And he, in this defense, just continued to find ways. And offensively, Bill O'Brien put a game plan together. Without Devontae Parker, Juju Smith-Schuster stepped up. And then the tight ends, right? You needed big plays. Hunter Henry did that. And then Ezekiel, he ran the ball well. But he, what he did even better for 
um, Bailey Zappi was was catch the ball out of the backfield. He started the scoring by catching the opening drive touchdown uh, to go up seven nothing, and the Patriots get to three wins, and the Steelers fall back now to seven and six outside the playoff window. Now they're going to have every opportunity. They take on uh, the Bengals, and or I think they take on I think they take on the Bengals and the uh, Colts over the next two weeks. Um, those are going to be teams that are going to be right in the mix for those final playoff spots because no one's catching the Ravens now at this point um, with how good they are uh, and you know, at the top of the division. So it's going to be all about the wild card and which team's able to get in. Is this the year Mike Tomlin's streak of you know above 500 seasons uh, or at 500 seasons um, comes to an end? We'll see down the stretch here with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, New England Patriots fans were a little upset with the win because they want to be as uh, high in the draft process to maybe go get the quarterback. Got a chance to talk to Mac Jones before the game a little bit. He seemed upbeat. His coaches talked about how he's had a good attitude around it. Sometimes you need to need to see it from a different place. That's always difficult when you're the starting quarterback, especially when you wear that C on your chest as captain of the team as well. Uh, but just told him to kept his head up, and uh, if you ever needed anything, you know, to to reach out. It's uh, uh, it was good to see a couple a um, couple guys that I mentored at the combine in in Mac Jones and and uh, Mitchell Trubisky too. That uh, it was a good to, opportunity to to chat with them a little bit. But the bigger picture in all this, Pittsburgh Steelers. This was a monumental game, and talking with some of the guys in the booth before the game. They say the atmosphere was a little different. I don't know why. There's a malaise or there's an apathy around. We are used to winning championships. This mediocre nine and eight mentality, getting you know, you know, booted out of the playoffs in, in, in the wild card weekend. That's not what we're used to. We're used to winning world championships. They may be one of the winningest organizations in all of football. Uh, in terms of winning championships, that's the team I grew up with. This is a, this is not a good look. And Mike Tomlin is ten and is, is three and ten versus Bill Belichick in these massive matchups. I'm also going to give you another crazy stat, and this one will tell you how good both of these teams have been over the last you know 30 years. This was the first time since 1995 that one of these teams, just one of them had five losses. Since 1995, it's the first game that at least one of these teams had five losses when they met. Now, if they met, of course, in week two and stuff like that, but they met a lot late in the year. And there's a chance of being in a place where you could have five losses. That's big. This year, both of them had five losses going into this game. So it just tells you how great of a matchup this football game has been and how Bill Belichick has simply had Mike Tomlin's number over the years that somehow needs to w find a way to change that, uh, change the narrative, change the standard when it comes to playing against Bill Belichick. Week 14's here. For everybody else, we're going to take a look at those games, those matchups, pick your best props for the weekend, and, and, and let it go when we come back right here on The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Welcome back, everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Let's get you ready for Week 14 in the NFL. I cannot believe it's Week 14 already. Uh, the playoff picture really shaping up. Three teams in the NFC have opportunities to clinch a playoff spot. They're the big three, of course, out there. The Cowboys, Philly, and San Francisco all have ways to be able to clinch a playoff berth this weekend if one thing or another happens uh, for these teams. So that tells you the cream of the crop in the NFC. In the AFC side of it, everything's kind of starting to tighten up. And... Um, since 1990, I think there's been 30% uh, of the teams that are sitting at 6-6 six and six heading into Week 13 have gotten a playoff berth. There's eight teams right now. If you all you know factor in what teams can do it, you're going to have an NFC South team. The only one that's at 6-6 six and six right now is the Atlanta Falcons. They only are the ones that have a chance. They could win the division and be, you know, will that. But I firmly believe, and I thought this was the case going into the year, that the AFC – uh, playoff participants, we're all going to have double need to have double digit uh, win totals, and and it's it's framing up that way. You're going to have to have at least ten wins this year to get into the playoffs in the AFC. You're not going to be able to sneak in with a nine and eight record 
uh, or an eight and nine record or something like that. You have to get to double digits, and it may even creep up to when we get into week 18 there, it may have to be up to 11 wins to make the playoffs in the AFC, and that should shape up for a wonderful playoff run down the stretch with some incredibly good games. Uh, let's start this week off with the Bucks at the Falcons. The Bucks just, you know, stumbling along, think they got it, then they don't. Mike Evans and Baker Mayfield clearly have a relationship that has blossomed this year. Mike Evans, again, goes over 1,000 yards for, the, I think, the 10th consecutive season to start a career. I mean, he's he just keeps doing it. The defense, hit or miss, the Falcons. I mean, you just you don't know what you're going to get with them except that they have a bunch of talent on offense, the defense plays better, and they have the best kicker in all of football. That's what you have in Atlanta. They're at home. They uh, are playing better football. They went on the road and beat a Jets team that uh, I think just is at the end of that, that, that rope um, on this season. And uh, you know, I think they're good enough to make it work. I like them at minus two and a half right now as the favorite at home. Uh, I think they can win by a field goal in this game because they have the best kicker. The Bucks may be able to keep it close, but Young Way Koo is the difference maker in the dome uh, to get the win for the uh, Atlanta Falcons in this divisional matchup that will extend their lead in the NFC South. My best player prop for this one, Bijan, anytime touchdown. Uh, they're starting to target him a lot more, whether it's in the passing game in the red zone or – handing him in the rock as well. So I like that for the player prop this weekend. All right, let's head to Chicago, where the Bears take on the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions come in as a favorite, finding a way to win a week ago, um, uh, or uh, finding a way to, to win that game against the Bears a couple weeks ago when they were down early and they got Jared Goff to throw a bunch of interceptions. Uh, I think it's going to be cold. I think the weather's going to affect Detroit a little bit. And I think that Justin Fields continues to improve and they run the football and the defense has gotten better. And, you know, I've said this over the last few weeks, Detroit is going to have to scratch and claw for every single win the rest of the way through. And if they start to stumble a little bit and they've got some very interesting games, the Green Bay Packers, who do not play a team where they will not be favored, the rest of the year, all of, a, all of a sudden could stick their nose in in the NFC North. That means Detroit has to find a way to win this ball game this weekend, and I don't know if it's that easy, easy of a task. I like the Bears here, plus three and a half in this matchup against the Detroit Lions. My player prop for this one is Jamison Williams, though. He goes over 15 and a half receiving yards. He can do that on one play, and they've been targeting him a lot the last few weeks. His speed is is other world right now, and uh, uh, and look for him to get much more than 15 and a half receiving yards in this matchup against the Bears. The Indianapolis Colts go to Cincinnati. The Colts now are sitting in a very good position to go to the playoffs. Gardner Minshew and Minshew Mania continues to uh, impress. They don't have Jonathan Taylor. Zach Moss steps up. Alec Pierce, uh, you know, Michael Pittman Jr., no matter who it is, everybody seems to be making some sort of contribution for this Indianapolis Colts team, which is fun to watch, especially we're watching a former Coug do it. Now, Jake Browning and Gardner Minshew in 2019 battled in an Apple Cup that was a very important one. Gardner had a chance to win their 11th game of the season win the Pac-12, I believe, and get a shot at the college football playoff. The snow started to come down, and unfortunately for us Cougs, Washington and Jake Browning uh, absolutely stepped all over Minshew and the Cougs that day. So there's a little payback here for the Colts. They are a dog, one and a half points, and I think that goes a long way uh, from what Jake Browning did on Monday night. Um it's still, still incredibly impressive. Uh, our prop queen, Ariel Epstein, likes the Jake Browning over rushing yards here. I like that too. Our top player prop in this one is going to be T. Higgins, over 35 and a half receiving yards. He kind of started to get in the mix with Jake Browning last week, so we like his over for the player prop in this one. 
As for the uh, the matchup between the Colts and uh, Bengals, I like the over, 44 points. I think some points get thrown up on the board here. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a, a field goal game, 31-28 or something like that. That will firmly put it you know, over the total in this matchup. Let's head to Cleveland with the Jacksonville Jaguars coming off an embarrassing loss at home to Cincinnati, lose their starting quarterback uh, with what looked like a very, very dangerous injury. Turns out it was a high ankle sprain. He is out on the field this week practicing. He's been limited. I do not know if they're going to go with Trevor Lawrence, but knowing that every game, because of where the Texans are at, see, the Texans have a game against the Jets. They find a way to win that one, and the Jags lose their second in a row. With the Ravens on deck next week, all of a sudden the Texans can take over the AFC South. And now if the Texans are sitting in a position to be AFC South champions and Jacksonville having to go on the road or maybe not make the playoffs at all, that's a completely different story. So uh, it would not surprise me if Trevor Lawrence tries to go in this game. He has yet to miss a game to start his career as a starting quarterback in this league. They go to Cleveland, who has an incredible defense. The total on this is 32 and a half. That's low. Uh, the weather could be bad. Joe Flacco showcased last week and how they played against the Rams. They're going to score points. They're going to get down the football field. And the Jags show they can score points, too. So I like the over here of 32 and a half. I don't quite know what's going to play out. The Jags are a three-point dog out on the lake there against Cleveland. My top player prop for this one is Flacco. His, his total here is 191 and a half yards. I know we've seen him a week now, and maybe some film will get, have got to him, and people are going to look and do things differently. But if you saw him step onto the field for the first time in some time against the Rams, there was no hesitation to pull that trigger. I mean, he just went. And he's going to throw for more than 190 yards. That's for, that's for darn sure. So we're going to go Flacco over 191 and a half passing yards in this matchup. Oh, the Carolina Panthers take on the New Orleans Saints. The Saints were the team in the NFC South that we thought was going to surprise everybody with the schedule that they had. Derek Carr in the mix. Well, Derek Carr cannot stay healthy. Going through concussion protocol, most likely won't go. Jameis Winston will start. Now, he's going to take chances. They may be able to score a lot more in the red zone than they have been able to with Derek Carr, but he's also going to turn the football over. And if Carolina is looking for an opportunity to steal a game here uh, and screw the Bears as much as they can, it would, be, it would behoove them to find ways to win football games. And uh, the Saints and the Panthers, uh, I think, could be a bit of a shootout. Jameis Winston going up against Bryce Young, back and forth a little bit. Not a lot of defense being played in this matchup. The over-under on this one is 37.5. We're going to go over the 37.5 for the Saints and the Panthers. My top player prop, Alvin Kamara, under 16.5 rushing attempts. I think he's utilized, uh, but I do think that they choose to throw the ball a lot more with Jameis Winston, and there's a lot of attempts on his side of things. And unfortunately, Alvin Kamara is going to be utilized more in the receiving game than actually carrying the football. So I'm going to go with his attempts under 16 and a half rush attempts for Alvin Kamara in this matchup. The Jets and the Texans. The Jets coming off that embarrassing loss to the Falcons last week when they should have somehow figured out a way to win. Uh, they thought Boyle was the answer and then Trevor Simeon late in the game. And now they're going back to Zach Wilson. Well, the books see adding Zach Wilson as a positive. The line uh, got a little bit closer when the announcement came that Zach Wilson was going to play. Why is that it? Why is that the case? Because the books know that Zach Wilson gives them the best chance to, to keep it close against the likes of the Houston Texans. The Texans are three and a half point favorites on the road against this Jets team. Now, I think that would bother me normally, but not this iteration of the Jets. With what we've seen been coming out of the, the locker room, you heard my rant earlier this week about what is the problem and what they do well. Zach Wilson is not the answer because it's not the quarterback's problem. It's the offensive play calling. It's the skill position players. And it's in, in particular, it's the offensive line. Defensively, they've been great all year, but they've started to kind of give up more and more bigger plays. C.J. Stroud has been as good as any quarterback in the league, okay? Not just rookies. He is in a position to throw his hat into the ring for MVP if he continues over the last five weeks of the season and puts them in a position to win the AFC South. So in this matchup, I like the over of 33 points. Now, 
Does that mean that the Jets score a bunch to keep it close? I don't think so. I think this could look a lot like maybe the Miami Dolphins game where they get boat raced a little bit. Maybe 24 to 13. Would even dare to say 30 to 10 beat down for the Jets in this one. And then it's just going to get worse and worse and worse in Houston. CJ, everybody's going to be riding high in Houston as it plays out. They lose Tank Dell, which is a big loss. Nico Collins is going to step up. John Mechie, maybe. Haven't heard much about him. He's kind of been relegated, dealing with his health issues, of course, coming into the league. But should maybe get a little more of a look this week. My top player prop for this one is all over C.J. Stroud, over 225.5 passing yards. He continues to have a, a great game. He leads the league in passing yards, I do believe. So uh, this, for me, is an easy over uh, for the young quarterback for the Houston Texans. Okay, The Minnesota Vikings take their show on the road to the Las Vegas Raiders. The Raiders, of course, coming off that loss to the Kansas City Chiefs a week ago where they had – you know, a chance to steal a win from the divisional opponent in their grasp. They couldn't get it done. They lose by 14 points. Now they take on a Vikings team who comes in as a favorite. A little surprise. Josh Dobbs is going to go, but Justin Jefferson is back, it looks like. And we're going to ride him all we can in this game, especially when I saw what his receiving yards over under was. But we're going Raiders plus the three here. At home, defense is playing much better. Offense still kind of stumbling along, but kind of finding their footing a little bit. You know, Antonio Pierce is the, is the shine off a little bit? No, I think they keep keep moving forward, keep fighting forward. He's fighting for a job to be the, the, the go from the interim head coach to the head coach of this Las Vegas Raiders team. So we're going to go Raiders plus the three. My top player prop for this one is Justin Jefferson in his return. Over 65 and a half receiving yards uh, in the uh, hookup with Josh Dobbs. The Seahawks for the second time in three weeks – We'll take on the 49ers. This gauntlet of 49ers, Cowboys, 49ers, Eagles for the Seahawks. When they started it, they were above 500, okay? They were 6-4. and four. They lose that game to the Rams that put them there at 6-4, and four, and then they had to take on the four opponents that were coming. There was every bit of a chance to be 6-8 and eight when this trip was over, and they started at 0-2. Now, they were a desperate team against the Cowboys, last week, but they still fell short. This time they go down and play a divisional opponent who they got boat raced by in Seattle, watching them go and dominate a Philadelphia Eagles team in Philly. Now, the San Francisco 49ers have a little bit of a uh, come back down to earth while the desperation still exists for Seattle? Yes. Every bit th that could happen. Will it with a 11-point favorite? I don't think so. All right? I like... Um, um, a, a tease here. Um, I went with the total and I went with over 42 and a half. Okay. Over 42 and a half points in this matchup uh, between the 49ers and the Seahawks. It's minus 200. So understand the value play in it. I think that's just, uh, I think that's almost just handing you the money knowing it's going to happen. The over here at 42 and a half. My top player prop for this one, Debo Samuel, over 10 and a half rushing yards. He's going to get that on one carry. They're going to put him in the backfield, spread out uh, Christian McCaffrey, run zone over Trent Williams, and Debo does his thing. He's become uh, a, a great asset to Kyle Shanahan to mix things up and do things differently, and he breaks tackles. All the 49ers break tackles in the open field. Debo Samuel, over 10 and a half rushing yards is my top player prop let's go to Kansas City where the Buffalo Bills come to town they've had some success during the regular season the last time I think last year they went into Kansas City and got the win of course uh some news broke this week around a speech that Sean McDermott gave to the Buffalo Bills I think back in 2019 around the 9-11 scenario I, I haven't I haven't dived too deep into it because I just don't really want to but that's a distraction the Chiefs coming off a loss uh, against the Green Bay Packers uh, on the road. They're trying to find their footing. But I was looking at something, and you have to look at conference record. The Chiefs are one game behind everybody who's above them. One game. They're 6-1 and one in conference, though. So if they find – that's almost a half a game because of it. If they find a way to win against Buffalo this week and stay within one game and ultimately have a tie with a bunch of the other teams at the top, that conference record is going to be a big difference. And then all of a sudden we're talking about it being the Kansas City Chiefs 
playoff invitational again to Arrowhead. This is their opportunity. Um, I just don't have any faith in Buffalo right now. I have faith in Josh Allen, but the team in general coming together on the road after the distraction once again this week uh, is just too problematic for me in a pick em game. So I'm going Chiefs. I think it's sitting right at around one point right now. Chiefs minus the one in this matchup against Buffalo, which I believe will knock the Buffalo Bills out of the playoffs. Um, they would have to win the remaining games on their schedule, and uh, their schedule isn't easy. They have the Dolphins in the final week. They have, like I said, the Chiefs, and then uh, they play somebody really, uh, really good as well uh, here in the next week, two, week or two. So the Bills have to find a way to win this football game or I think it's over. And uh, will that desperation um, show its heart? Yes. Will the distraction of this week and all the things that go into it also be a, a factor? Yes, it will. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs get it done at home against Josh Allen, their rivals, the Buffalo Bills, in this matchup. My, my top player prop for this one is Dalton Kincaid. Uh, Green Bay's um, tight ends had a field day against Kansas City last week, and I expect Dalton Kincaid – to do the same. His over under of receiving yards was set at 35 and a half. He could have that literally on the first drive uh, with Josh Allen in this, this offense. So we'll go Dalton Kincaid over his 35 and a half receiving yards. Let's go to Broncos chargers in LA Broncos coming off that devastating loss on the road to the Houston Texans chargers coming off uh, a game in which they won with two field goals by Cameron Dicker, their kicker, six to nothing on the road against the New England Patriots, come home and take on a Broncos team within their division. The Broncos need the win. Staley needs every possible win the rest of the way through to save his job. I don't know if it's possible because of what's gone on over the last few weeks, but I don't like this line at all. It's sitting at two and a half. I don't know what happens here. It, you know, Chargers could win by three uh, as easily as the Broncos could win by three in this one. So I went with the total. The total is 43 and a half. Um, it's gone up to 44. Uh, and I'm going to go with the under on this one. I'm going to go 21-17 to the victor. Okay? 21-17 to the victor, whoever that is, the Chargers or the Broncos in this matchup. So we're going to go under the 44-point total in this one. My top player prop, Gerald Everett, tight end for the Los Angeles Chargers, over his 30 and a half receiving yards then to the biggest game of the weekend for a lot of people it's the Eagles traveling down to take on their divisional rival the Dallas Cowboys Mike McCarthy out for the week with an appendicitis had the surgery apparently uh, hearing from Jerry Jones he'll be back on the sideline coaching this game Dan Quinn in the defense was a bit embarrassed a week ago against Seattle um, Philadelphia was embarrassed uh, throughout the entire team with the loss to the San Francisco 49ers last week is bound to happen with the games that they were going to have to play, the Chiefs, the Bills, the Eagles, uh, the Cowboys, and then go to the Seahawks uh, out all the way to Seattle. You were going to lose a game during that process. If you said you came out of that five-game gauntlet, four and one, I think everybody in Philly would take that. This game has a lot of implications. First off, it's Dak Prescott and Dallas. Uh, going up against Jalen Hurts and the Eagles. Don't forget a year ago when Philly went down and played the Dallas Cowboys, Gardner Minshew was at the helm. Jalen Hurts was out with the injury, and Dallas found a way to win. Didn't talk about that game as heavily as they will if the Dallas Cowboys are able to find a way to win this game. But also, if they do beat Philly, Philly then comes back to the field. They'll have their third loss with a split against the Dallas Cowboys, a loss to the San Francisco 49ers, and now Philly is outside looking in in terms of home field advantage. Also, the Cowboys all of a sudden have a chance at the NFC East, which means Philly would have to go on the road from the start in the playoffs, and I think that's going to be problematic. Whatever team in the NFC uh, gets to the Super Bowl this year, they're going to do it from home. Home field advantage is going to be the difference in the NFC playoffs this season, whether that's in Dallas, San Francisco, or Philadelphia ultimately we'll wait and see for me this game was all about points uh, it was a high scoring game in philadelphia 
The number sits at 51 and a half. I like the over. I think this game is a game that ends up in the 30s. Once again, Jalen Hurts back and forth against Dak Prescott could look very similar to what the Seahawks-Cowboys game looked like last week. Dallas scores. So does Philly. Um, and you're going to need that. Um, you're going to need this, the points scored because right now the defense for the Philadelphia Eagles is struggling mightily to get guys on the ground and tackle in space. And the linebacking core has been a problem. And Dak Prescott is going to um, utilize that uh, in a ton of different ways, as well as Mike McCarthy. How much of him being out is going to affect it? I don't think that much. Um, you know, technology these days, the appendectomy part of it, I've been through that surgery. You're in and out. Uh, you, you can get right back to doing what you're doing, just doing it from a resting position. That's all. So there you have it. I'm going to go over the 51 and a half in this game, hoping for a great game on Sunday night football between these two arch divisional rivals. My in uh, my top player prop is also my same game parlay. Let's go. Jalen Hurts and Tony Pollard, anytime touchdown. That's going to give you a plus 260 uh, value right there. And that is, I mean, that is as automatic as you get. Last week, we went Christian McCaffrey and Jalen Hurts, anytime touchdown, same game parlay. And boy, that hit. That was a plus 200. This is even better because both of them, if once you see Philly get inside the five-yard line, you're pretty much guaranteed Jalen Hurts for a touchdown. And Tony Pollard has started to get more carries in the red zone and stick his nose in there for touchdowns. So that's our same game parlay as well as our top player prop for the matchup between Philly and Dallas. All right. When we come back, we're going to break down the Army-Navy game, the only college football game left on the slate, as well as take a look at the Heisman Trophy, where the four finalists were announced and are here in New York right now and will be announced tomorrow night. Who will be the 2023 Heisman Trophy champion? I know who LSU Tiger fans really want them to be. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. College football is coming to an end. Uh, we had a heck of a year. You trailed us this year in college football. We won a lot of money. Uh, let's try to keep it going here. One final game of the weekend. Army-Navy, the game that sits alone on a Saturday after the college football season has ended, is still one of the best uh, legacy, pageantry, historical games that there is out there. Of course, to celebrate uh, the military academies and the sacrifices the men and women make for us to enjoy football like this. Uh, both of these teams sit at five and six. So essentially, this has a lot riding on it because it's a bull bid that's sitting right there for one of these teams to go to six and six uh, and have a chance to play one more game together in a bowl game. This game has moved around a little bit. This year, it is in Massachusetts at Foxborough where the Patriots play their home football games. Um, I look forward to this every year just simply because of the pageantry and just how um, these young men um, play the game and, uh, and go about their business. Uh, both of them run a very similar offense. You're going to see a lot of running, physical, uh, defensive football, um, and it's almost a flip of the coin a lot of times. But for me, it, 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 it sits in my family's history uh, in the military branches. And my father serving two tours in Vietnam as an Army grunt uh, keeps me in a very, very uh, focused category when it comes to picking this game. You know, sometimes you got to go with the analytics side of things. Sometimes you got to go with loyalty and family and what it means. And just like anybody who's a part of each academy, Army beats Navy in this one. The idea of them being three point favorites, I don't know. If you, you want to tease it down to minus two and a half so a field goal wins it, by all means get it done. The over-under of 28 points. Woo! Eh, you know, I'd love to see a shootout. Wouldn't surprise me if it's 10 to 7. So, you know, maybe stay away from the total. But if I was going to pick, I'd probably say the under. Uh, you, you really can't go wrong betting the under on Army-Navy. It tends to fall in that direction. The biggest conversation, well, it's been a, a huge dialogue uh, on social media platforms for me, the show, and the LSU Tiger faithful. The Heisman Trophy. Everybody and their dog 
outside of Baton Rouge, I think, believes this is an open conversation to be had. Wins mean something. One of the college football playoff committee clearly told us that wins don't mean really anything. So maybe that's the case for the Heisman Trophy. Who knows? Maybe it isn't. Jaden Daniels, who transferred from Arizona State out in Tempe, the Pac-12, and came to the SEC under Brian Kelly, has really run roughshod around the SEC. I made it very clear this week that the SEC was down this year. It's not a slight on anybody. It's just facts. They weren't as good as they have been over the last decade and a half, where they've dominated. So the competition hasn't been as great. So the performance by Jaden Daniels against the likes of the Florida Gators, uh, though you know transformative and historic, doesn't hold as much weight for me as what, let's say, Michael Penix did against the likes of of the Oregon Ducks in two separate occasions. I digress. Jaden Daniels has been an incredible player for the LSU Tigers. Very deserving of the Heisman Trophy. Maybe me going a little bit too far saying that he would hold a clipboard at both Washington and Oregon has erupted in a ton of vitriol from LSU Tiger fans. There's truth in that, though. I don't know if he would be the starting quarterback there, if they went and actually had a competition. I think both of those quarterbacks fit perfectly well with what they do offensively for both those offenses. Does that mean Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr., if they had transferred to LSU, uh, they wouldn't have been able to beat out Jaden Daniels? Possibly. Brian Kelly really, um, you know, has formatted this offense to um, focus on on his skill set and make him very, very good. The four finalists, we've mentioned three of them. Jaden Daniels, Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., Marvin Harrison Jr. as well. The wide receiver out of Ohio State, who has had an epic career, uh, uh, is on site as the fourth finalist uh, as they head um, for a historic Heisman Trophy presentation. JD5 received the AP Player of the Year this week. Uh, So that starts you leaning in the direction that most likely he's going to be the Heisman Trophy winner. Um, It wouldn't surprise me. My vote right now would be for Jaden Daniels as the Heisman Trophy winner, Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix, and Roman Dunze. Wait a minute. How did I vote again? No, no, no. My vote was Michael Penix first, JD5 second, Nix third, Roma Dunze fourth. That was my ballot that I sent in. No, 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 no. That's that's not right. No, my ballot was Bo Nix was one. Uh, Michael Penix Jr. was two. Uh, JD5 was three. And Roman Dunze was four. Yeah, that was it. That was it. I, I don't know. I can't remember. I can't remember what I sent in. Uh, enjoy the ceremony Saturday night, everybody. And stick around afterwards. ESPN is doing a 1997 Heisman race documentary. Apparently, there were three Pro Football Hall of Famers in that class and some clown. I don't know. Enjoy, everybody. See you Monday.